Sawa di Krap, and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 to walk in Leo's footsteps, but instead of DiCaprio, I settled for the beer, and I just kind of let it ride. <laughs> An honest mistake. <laughs> and I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 21 years ago, fell in love with periodically checking whether any plastic I own has melted onto my coffee table in the Bangkok heat and humidity, so I never left. <laughs> nice one. You ever see the photos of those people who live in like Dubai and they leave like a, you know some food on the dashboard or something, and they come back and it's just <laughs> like a, a puddle of goo under their front seat. Well, I'm telling you, man. Anything I own that's plastic, like I, it, 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 if it stays in my apartment too long without the aircon on, it will melt. Yeah, I've wondered about that. Like you, you know a computer like a macbook like they they make one they make them to one spec for the world right you know does it does it matter if you go between canada and thailand or something you know? well hopefully hopefully they test them for that stuff yeah i'm hopefully. hoping for the price they charge you all right we want to give a big thanks to all of our patrons who support the show patrons get a whole bunch of cool stuff including our ad free regular show a day early emails with behind the scenes photos of our interviews access to our discord server to chat with me Greg and other listeners, and various other goodies. But best of all, patrons also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and Bangkok topics. We just finished recording this week's bonus show, and we chatted about how the yearly poison air season is starting to make parents like Greg wonder when their kids will ask them why they even live here still. A mythical Facebook group made up of English-speaking expat handymen that turned out to be true. And more news on Thailand's reopening, despite having the highest daily cases of the whole pandemic. To learn how to become a patron, click the support button at the top of our website. Right on. And as always, if you have something to say or a show idea or a joke or just want to say hi, head to BangkokPodcast.com and click the little microphone button on the bottom right of our new website to leave us a voicemail that we can play on the show. All right. Well, on this episode, we have someone who you may have seen on the internet, especially over the past year, as his videos have kind of blown up on YouTube. He's known for making incredibly well-researched videos on the history of Bangkok's various districts and neighborhoods. I am, of course, talking about Bangkok Pat, who also makes some very fun videos on the cultural, historical, or odd quirks that the quirky characters of this quirky city love hearing about. Now, most of Pat's videos put the focus squarely on the places and the stories, and he doesn't talk a lot about himself, so I was psyched to sit down with him and chat off-camera to learn a little bit more. So here is my conversation with our buddy, Bangkok Pat. All right, well, we are super happy to be sitting down with someone who I've seen many, many times on my monitor, uh, and a lot of our listeners have asked to have on the show, and that is one Mr. Bangkok Pat. Pat, welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. Thanks, Greg. Absolute pleasure. And I've been listening to the podcast for oh, a long time, a couple of years, and I thought maybe one day it would be interesting to uh, tell a story or two, but I never thought it'd be about at my YouTube channel, so um, <laughs> right, it, it's great. Thanks for uh, for having me. No, it's a pleasure to meet you, and it's really interesting because you're one of these new sort of, I say new, but m contemporary uh, people on YouTube who are making great content about life in Bangkok. And I mean, podcasts, you know, it's it's kind of a niche of a niche thing. I, I dig it. It's an old school sort of audio only medium. But YouTube is really where the action's at. And I just don't have the time or the resources to, to yeah. get into it. Yeah. But your videos have really seemed to take off. And listeners, if you're not familiar with Bangkok Pat, he makes a fantastic 
uh, ongoing series of videos about the history of different parts of Bangkok, you know, for, uh, the streets, the neighborhoods, and includes some great well-researched information, including photos and sort of little-known FAQs about areas that people might not have known about. Well worth a, a watch, every single one of them, and they're always really interesting. So that's what we're here to talk about. So, I mean, tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you don't talk a lot about yourself on your videos, but where do you come from, man? I grew up in London. I was born in UK. Um, I was almost born in Bangkok. My mum's Thai. Okay. And my mum and dad had to get back to England because my granddad was ill. So they just landed in time for me to be born. Oh, wow. In, in the UK. Yeah. My oldest sister was born here. Um, I grew up in London, studied in London. Um, the reason why a lot of people seem to think I'm nothing like a Thai or how a half Thai should be, I suppose, <laughs> is because I, I grew up pretty much as a British person. My mum died when I was pretty young. Um, before she died, we were pretty much a Thai household we spoke thai we understood thai we ate thai food and then after my mum died i became a teenager i sort of just started growing up and sort of forgot my heritage and then where i was growing up in london there was a lot of it was a very diverse area a lot of uh, immigrants from different parts of the world yeah. and a lot of my friends at school had uh, sort of a, a different heritage a different background I thought, hang on, so have I, you know. And as I got older, I thought, I'm gonna, you know, seek it out. Oh, okay. And uh, arrived in Bangkok in my early twenties. And you've been here ever since. Uh, pretty much, yeah. I spent a few years going back and forth, um, made friends, and sort of decided to bite the bullet after a few problems I had back in the UK, and uh, just thought I'd see what it was like. I bought my records here, uh, started as a DJ. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, um, which, which helped a lot. And I just sort of settled into Bangkok life, I would say, not the hard way, but uh, I didn't come here with bags of money and I wasn't, in, I wasn't living in a great area. Yeah, I, feel I know what that's like. Yeah. <laughs> Petrobury Road, um, which turned out to be a really, really great place, actually. It's funny. That's that's where I first lived when I first came to, to Bangkok. I lived on uh, Union Tower, which we called Union Palace, <laughs> because it was kind of a scummy little place at the end of Tongla on Petbury. And I, I continue to dislike Petbury Road to this day. It's such a dreary stretch of dusty, abandoned it is, offices. Yes, yeah. I've been along parts of it for videos, Makassan video I was, right, right. I was up and down I, at the, the Ekamai video I, was, I lived at the end of Ekamai oh okay. that part near Foodland oh yeah. yeah right 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 yeah right Kanchner apartment um, 3,400 a month oh I was getting ripped off I was paying 6,000 a month for my little place <laughs> but I did have blue pleather sofa so that was pretty cool yeah I, we, we had uh, I say we I had um, a very small balcony that overlooked the railway line <laughs> And it took a few weeks to get used to the tri timings of the trains rumbling by in the mornings. It's funny. Yeah, I, I was look my balcony looked over the railway lines too. We probably lived you know, <laughs> 10 blocks apart yeah. <laughs> there. Foodland, is, uh, there's something that sets it apart from other supermarkets. It, it was the first one to import stuff because <laughs> here I am going off on history here. Pat Pong, first one was in Pat Pong. And they were catering for the local demographic at the time. There was a lot of Americans um, in that area. So they started importing a lot of stuff. So that's how they become, I think they've got a bit of a cult following. Yeah, you know, this is, again, a bit of a tangent, which, we, of course, we encourage here <laughs> on the Bangkok podcast. Um, I God, I forget how. I think I wrote a blog about it. It was about five years ago now. And I somehow got introduced to the guy who started Foodland. God, I forget his name, a really old, wiry, sprightly guy. And uh, he introduced me to the guy who's in charge of all his ordering, all the food and tukladi and stuff like this. And uh, this this dude was amazing. He was he, he was walking around like a gangster, like he had uh, people following him. And he was he gave me like a one year membership to the spa at like this building he owned. And he would walk into a place and they'd be like, oh, hi, Charlie or hi, Charlie, whatever his name was. 
And uh, yeah, it's really thrived. It has a really fascinating history as a company here. It reminds me, and I've said this in a video, it remind, reminds me of the Safeways mm, right. back in the 80s. Yeah, Just yeah. Just the decor and the shelves and the way it's sort of all laid out. Um, I'll tell you, the, the furnishings. The, the food land at Nana Plaza at 3 a.m. is an interesting place to be. <laughs> yeah, I know it will. Um, not at 3 a.m., but uh, if, I, if I've been out shooting late right. um, and I need to get food and I've missed all the malls, um, I will usually go to Foodland somewhere and get get a takeout. Yeah, you can't go wrong. Yeah. It's good and stuff. It's, it's good stuff because what they cook is what they sell in the supermarket. So you, you know it's going to be decent quality. Right, right. And the prices are very good. People complain. One guy I met, he said, oh, I can get fried rice outside for, for 10 baht less. I said, all right, you, you eat there and I'll go in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are certain things in Bangkok and Thailand that I, I'm happy to pay an extra few cents for more. You know, like it's when you see one of those, uh, you know, beef buffets on the side of the barbecue buffets, like, oh, you can eat for 299 baht. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm okay paying 500 baht for some all you can eat food. Yeah, I know. Um, that's that, that's the, uh, sort of like a subject of a video I'm working on now. Yeah. Um, when I was new here, and just sort of dipping my toe into the expat community. Um, you'd meet guys who were old hands, old timers, and they always had this information. They would give you what they thought would be useful to you. And over years, you realize that probably about 60% of this information is absolute rubbish. <laughs> It's all made up. Um, it's I wouldn't, maybe lies would be the wrong word, but you realise that a lot of these guys didn't have a clue. Really, they were living in a parallel universe. Yeah, we did a recent show on that about about advice that we got that we ignored and shouldn't have. But we we forgot to cover the part that you know it's 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 sort of the diamond in the rough. There, you got to. It's like going through Thai visa or something. You've not. Oh, I know. I'm, <laughs> very, I'm banned. You've got to search if you want to find the good stuff. So you're you're living in Bangkok, and um, you're you're. I've got. I assume you just sort of have eventually have a job, uh, like a real job, or would you just continue DJing? I, I was DJing. Sorry, not to assume, not to say that not, DJing is not a real job, but I mean a nine to five kind of thing. No, with the DJing at that time, there was there was only about three or four foreign DJs, and it was a real novelty to be a foreign DJ at the time. What year are we talking about, roughly? Two thousand three. Oh, okay. two thousand. Two, three, okay. that time, yeah. Um, first thing I did when I got here was go to a recording studio. I went and recorded a CD of the all the dance music I was playing at the oh. time. And I had all the fresh dance stuff from the UK. So this CD I made was all new music. And it was great because all the new music in the UK didn't really arrive here like until a year or a couple of years later. Oh, okay. um, because the, it was, the scene was not connected really in those days there wasn't the internet there was no soundcloud or any anything at all yeah people forget what a sort of a lonely universe it was back then. <laughs> pre-facebook pre-twitter like yeah not everyone had internet in their house they didn't know and uh so those records i bought with me lasted me for about two or three years i didn't need to buy any new music although they were they were music they were dance music shops in bangkok that were importing stuff and I did take trips back to back to London quite you know quite a couple of times a year mm. to get stuff, but uh, I also realised that you know there wasn't there was only about five clubs that people went to in Bangkok regularly um, that were so called international sort of style. The Q but, bar bed. Yeah, Q bar. Uh, Ministry of Sound was here for a while, but they. That, yeah, that was there, mm. uh, and didn't play there. Didn't play uh, in bed. There was small places that had been popular at the end of the 90s that were still sort of dragging on a little bit. I mean, <laughs> those were the places I played at first. Um, played in a lot of empty clubs. Faith Club was the first place that uh, gave me a regular slot. Okay, I remember it, but I don't think I was over there. Yeah. Um, it had been voted Best Club 2003, oh, right. which is great because a lot of people came. And through working there as a DJ, I did meet other people who were customers there that were 
that offered me a job in sales, offered me a job uh, in teaching English, all that kind of thing. So it was, a, it was I found it was a way of making connections. Uh, I met, right. some, met some really nice people. Met some real strange people as well. <laughs> yeah, as, as, as you, you do. Would, as you would. But uh, yeah, I mean, as it, it comes back around to the theme of the video I'm doing about advice you were given by other foreigners when you first arrived. It got me sort of thinking, I was writing, taking notes, writing down all the stuff. Uh, I also put it out on Twitter, you know, what was the stuff you were told when you got here that turned out to be complete, you know, fiction. <laughs> so there's some interesting stories um, that, that are going to come out in, in that. And I've sort of put it into a way of surviving in Thailand. I've done a few videos called Surviving in Thailand. And this will be part of that. You, it, it, you do need to develop a really interesting uh, level of surviving that you don't have to do back home. Like I'm from Canada and, you know, if someone stops you on the street, it's like, hey there, friend, how you doing? But you need to sort of develop this shell around you living, uh, I guess, in a much, much of the world too, especially in an area like Asia where it's a little bit crazier, a little bit unpredictable, uh, more unpredictable than you're used to. But you need to have a harder defense built up around you because you do meet strange people and there are people here that take advantage of you more Definitely. so more so i think than than what i i ever knew back home yeah yeah that's true um i did an interview with a, another youtuber and he said uh, he said the guys to watch out for uh, not the ties generally it, it can be usually other expats or other people masquerading as expats you know, if you show a bit, slightest bit of vulnerability, they would uh, they would try to you know jump in there and somehow uh, get something out of you. And I found that a lot in the early days. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I remember I was sitting at the Bangkok Baking Company in the foot of the JW Marriott on the corner of Soy Two. Two, um, great place. Um, and uh, me and my buddy used to have lunch there a couple times a week and we kept seeing this guy and eventually we got to talking to him, this old guy, and he spun this incredible tale about how he used to go to school with Omar Sharif in Egypt. And it was this huge thing and my friend was Egyptian, so he was talking in Arabic to him and, you know, this amazing thing. And eventually it got to the point where this guy asked to borrow like 5,000 baht and it was like... I don't think anyone who went to school with Omar Sharif is going to be asking to borrow 150 bucks in Bangkok. I know, yeah, it comes back around to that, <laughs> um, which is it's a shame um, because I was quite uh, quite open to having conversations with guys uh, who would come and start conversations with you, which which did happen. Yeah. It was a shame sometimes when after you know the, after the second beer of having a chat with this guy, I'd sort of thinking, how do I get out of this? You know, I've got to somehow yeah. escape. And It's like getting to know someone and then they throw out like, oh, but because you know the earth is flat, you're like, oh, wow, <laughs> yeah. I need to get need to plot <laughs> an exit strategy. Yeah, or you'd meet guys who would completely change character after a beer. Yeah, it, it's a bit of a minefield, man. Living here long term, uh, those people that you keep around you that are like the good people, they're they're gold. You got to hang on to those people because there's so many that get taken out by they're just there. They're weird or they turn out to be abusive or they're hiding something or they're lying or trying to scam you, you know, and after five years, eight years, 10 years, the people that are still with you that are still here, they're, they're incredibly valuable hmm. to the sanity of someone who lives here long term because you need that cultural connection yeah. with, with people from overseas that you can share with. So um, I don't, don't know where I'm going with that. It's kind of the end of my story. I just want to say that the people that, <laughs> that are good people are gold and should be valued. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So let's talk about your videos a little bit. Now, are are you as big of a history nerd as I am with this stuff? Um, I always was, probably from the days of being 12 and 13. And I, one, one day at my local library in London, I got access to all the old maps and photos and just something clicked to me. I thought, ah, oh, this is brilliant. You know, my old neighborhood, my my neighborhood used to have a railway here, it used to have this, it used to look like this. I lived in a huge brand new housing estate in North London, um, which recently became well known as one of the worst places for crime. <laughs> so, but, um, Andover Estate, yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, I was fascinated by it. And I always sort of was, but I never really put it into anything that I was doing ever. And then it was only when I sort of had this idea a couple of years ago, I, could, I thought I could show people Bangkok and uh, get to sort of know a little bit about the history and that kind of thing. And then COVID come. So I couldn't sort of set up this tour sort of idea that I had. So I thought I'm gonna, I'll buy a camera and I'll make some videos and walk around Bangkok. And then I realized there was like a hundred other guys doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, I'll, all right, I'll do a video of my area and I'll have a look into the past and see what I can find. And uh, the first video did okay because it got shared by a couple of guys on Twitter. Um, there was Phil from Ajan.com. Sure. Uh, Stick Boy shared it. It got several hundred views, which was a lot for a first video. So uh, it just sort of developed from that. But with the history thing, I never knew all this stuff before I did the videos, really. It's only as I've gone around each area and researched them before I've done it that I've discovered all this stuff. And, you know, it's only in the last few months I've got to places like like Talad Noy, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the way I organise doing a video has changed a little bit as well. In the past, uh, I would just go there, walk around and sort of hope to see something. Nowadays, I will take a good look at um, Google Maps, Google Earth, see what's there. But then, you know, my first couple of days walking around will still be a little bit blind because you do find stuff that you uh, find fascinating, you know, as you get there. Right. Like Makassan, for example, wasn't, I had no idea about really about the area. I just, one day I was out in the morning, which is hap which happens quite a lot. I was out in the morning thinking I still got no idea where I'm going next for a video. Uh -huh. And I just, I got off at Makassan sort of uh, totally on a whim and thought, right, this is it. And I was walking around at street level and I saw all these interesting old buildings, all these wooden houses. And but even there's the big railway that goes up to the airport link, but there's not a lot else there. Some old train yards, but it's kind of a Well, that's the thing. Area. Most of it is actually State Railway of Thailand land. Right. And there's hundreds of these old wooden houses that were built over a hundred years ago for railway employees. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the families and spouse, um, live in these houses still. Oh, okay. Like descendants of the original rail workers. The, yeah. Um, and the houses uh, are still there. They still live there rent-free, electricity, paid for, everything. And right. I think this is part of where State Railway of Thailand's debt comes from, things like this, that they did for their employees when they first built that depot in 1910. Right. Also charging 15 baht for a 140-kilometer trip might be part of it. But. Yeah. The fares <laughs> haven't gone up since the mid-80s. Yeah, that's um, a different, different And even on, on Sundays, it's even free. Really? Uh, for, for ties, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, which is which is weird. So, yeah, but vast. There's still vast areas of the land there um, that are owned by State Railway of Thailand. But then I, I sort of, I go down, I go down soys that I, that I just sort of take at random. Um, I go and see what's at the end. Um, like when I did Prom Pong, I did a video about that area. Um, I went down soy thirty nine. And there was a plaque um, that was in the on the pavement, wow. and they'd obviously repaved it and put the plaque back upside down. And this plaque was to do with a government housing project from forty years earlier, where a certain Bangkok governor at the time had provided a load of local social housing for local people who were displaced um, near a canal. Right, and it's just little things like that. That uh, I put I put in videos that I think um, are you make them unique. Those, those little strings that you can pull on, and then you don't know exactly where they'll lead. Like a plaque and a sidewalk leads you to a housing estate, and that might lead you to someone famous who lived there. Or, you know, yeah, who knows? little little things like that. Well, there's real value in that that groundwork, right? I mean, it's I've I've written I've written a lot of 
you know, photo comparison blogs and things like that. And it's, I just use Google Street View because I don't, I don't have time to get out and, and, and pound the pavement. But there's real value in that. And you can find incredible stuff that no one knows about or no one ever finds, uh, especially if they're sitting behind a desk and doing their research. But, yeah, and then comes the the what well, the donkey work as we call it, um, <laughs> which is in front of the Google, right? And doing right. the searches for these old photos of these areas. Sometimes it takes me a couple of hours to literally find an old photo of an area that might be just for a ten second slot in the video that I'm right. doing. Can you can you? I assume you're fluent in Thai. You can search in Thai in English as well. Uh, I can't read and write Thai. Uh, I can understand figures and stuff. Um, spoken Thai, um, I forgot most of it <laughs> after my mum died. But when I arrived here, I found I could understand a lot more than I was st- able to still speak because uh, it was the spoken part which sort of deserted me as a teenager growing up, having no no Thai spoken in the house anymore. Yeah. So um, that's still part of something that uh, I could definitely improve on. But in the videos, I find it's not, it's not necessary. People say, oh, you should speak Thai in your videos. Uh, I say, well, my demographic is more towards uh, expats or people who know Bangkok, who have lived here before and um, have an idea of you know, where, I, where these areas are. Well, that's that's an interesting point because that's what I wanted to ask you about as well. Were you this interested in the history of London when you lived there? Because what I find is like I'm I'm from Calgary, Alberta, in Canada, and uh, I don't know anything about the history of Calgary. I find when I when I ever saw photos or read books or anything, I found it incredibly boring and stuff that I couldn't care less about. But suddenly I'm in Bangkok and I'm fascinated by it, and I find that a lot of of I end up knowing a lot more about the history of the place and the little facts about the place than most Thais I know. Yeah, it's funny you say that because that's what that's what people say to me as well. So, um, I got a lot of Thai subscribers mainly through the railway related videos I've been doing, um, but there's a there's a healthy percentage are Thais who say, "Oh, we didn't know this," or like I, a couple of weeks ago I did. Uh, Thailand's role in World War One. Did a video on that, and a lot of people said they, you know, this should be taught in school. What, what we did, uh, it's something I think Thailand should be definitely proud of. Uh, World War One, their role there, you know, and there's a memorial in Sanam near Sanam Luang and stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, just with the history stuff in general around Bangkok, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, um, a lot of Thais say they they weren't aware of or possibly maybe wouldn't have been interested in it anyway until they you know until they found it out but back in london um we learned a lot of the history of london and the local area in school anyway so uh, it was sort of second nature right 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 to you didn't have to do a lot of digging right because it was all, all there yeah and we could go to libraries and look in books and uh, libraries had archives of photos that you could go and right, right. go and look at um, let's talk technical details for the geeks out there like myself. What do you shoot on and what do you edit on? Um, pretty basic stuff, actually. Um, when I first started, I bought a camera, a Sony Alpha 5100. Mm-hmm. It's quite an old 2014 model, um, and I still use it. Really? I was, okay. I was going to upgrade. Uh, the next one up was the f- 6000. But they took off settings on the 6000 that they had on the 5100. So I thought, oh, I'll give the 6000 a miss. And what's the next one up is the 6400. And it's, it's a huge jump in my in budget. So I just <laughs> haven't got around to it. So I've actually got it there. I've still, so I'm still using the 5100. It's got a picture. There's this, the picture sort of um, color that I like using. It's, very, it's quite cinematic. Um, so I've just kept using it. Um, and even now, even in quite a few review magazines, people ask, you know, what are the entry level vlogging cameras? And it is still recommended. Okay, cool. Well, it looks great. The videos look great. Yeah. Um, recording, I've got all my equipment here. I use the Zoom H1N Mm -hmm. audio recorder. I use a Rode. Yeah. 
uh, mm. Lavalier Mike, Mike. Because if anything, I want I want the voice to. Because I I did radio in the past as well, mm. and there's something about uh, audio quality that um, I'm pretty fussy about. Yeah. So just one of those things. There's a lot of cheap stuff you can buy on, on the market, you know, and it just doesn't sound as as I want it to. What about editing? Editing, I use uh, what people say is a pretty basic system, is a Move RV video editor. Uh, I think it's up to number 22 now, 22.1. Okay. And it's a pretty basic system. I did try Adobe Prem- Premiere. Premiere. Mm-hmm. There's too much on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit overkill, overkill, right? It's it's too much. There's too many things. You know, to do a basic thing like a like a transition, I've got to go through three different things <laughs> to find this. Uh, with the Move RV, it's got everything, and it was the only editing software I found that you can actually look at the sound in waves. Mm, right. It's got a waveform on the Yeah, under the in track. front of you in the storyboard. Right. So I can synchronize stuff. I can synchronize my clips to the beat of the sound right. of the song because I can see it. And that goes back to from being a DJ and stuff. Um, so do you get a lot of uh, letters, emails, messages from people? Uh, is, is there any negative? Is there lots of positive? Do you get show ideas? Do people get too pushy? Negative, not really. Um, no one's ever attacked me personally. Um, so people joke about uh, my polo shirts. <laughs> there is a story around that. I was using... Um, I had this thing for a while about... Um, there was too much bass on my voice. I had a real sort of hang-up about it. And it was because the mic was right here. Okay. Right on your voice box. Right on my voice box when I'm wearing T-shirts. Okay. So I always wear polo shirts now because I can actually put the mic down here. Uh-huh. See, there's a reason for that. Yeah. Smart. So that is a reason for that. And uh, I didn't get attacked for it, but someone did mention it. And someone mentioned my hair was growing, was growing gray. And I thought they must have looked really uh, closely to find yeah no doubt. <laughs> I wish someone would complain about my hair going gray but I don't have that luxury um, <laughs> one of my videos was analyzed by a Thai visa thread oh god thread on Thai visa and they were analyzing whether I had a work permit to do it oh, another geez. one analyzed the brand of the polo shirts and someone else mentioned the way I walked Okay, cool. Thanks. I thought, hey, it's so typical Thai Helpful. visa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And someone pointed, pointed, gave me a link on Twitter, and then the thread had actually been binned at some point. <laughs> it's probably yeah, good. it's like, what well, is? Uh, but yeah, like I say, you know, it's so typical of uh, of Thai visa. Yeah, but no, the most negative stuff is probably other foreigners making comments about pronunciation. Well, Pat, thanks so much for talking about your work. Um, you're doing, no matter what anyone says out there, you're doing great stuff. And uh, I think the the viewership uh, is evidence of that because a lot of people really appreciate it. And again, it takes so much work to research and write and record and film and edit. Uh, I, I think people might not know how much work it takes. So you're doing really great stuff. And I urge anyone, if you haven't seen Pat's stuff, uh, check it out because it's a great insight into Bangkok's history. And uh, just terrifically uh, entertaining videos. So thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks, Greg. It's been great having a chat. Um, well, both on mic and off mic. Yeah, and it's been it's been an experience. Well, hopefully, uh, I mean, if you see uh, listeners, if you see Pat out there recording, don't bother him. He's hard at work. <laughs> and uh, maybe we're running run into you some down some nameless soy somewhere. Yeah, yeah, obscure soy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Random soy, as that's I call right. them. Yeah. All right. Thanks, sir. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thanks, Greg. <laughs> Dude, he's such an interesting guy. You know, you and I have our take as foreigners, but his take is just different being half Thai. It's not the same. That's right. Yeah. And, but, you know, he's, he's you know, ethnically half Thai, but culturally he grew up in the UK. So he sort of got that fascination with this foreign place that 
that we have, but also, like you said, like like he has a more a more real connection to the place than we do. We're just sort of like outside observers, but he's got you know a, a you know a real connection that we don't have. True that, true that, and of course the Thai language helps, right? Um, but uh, but just the way the way that Thai people look at him will be different from the way they look at us. Yeah, I, I also find it fascinating too. I'm glad we chatted about how you know like. I don't know anything about Calgary where I grew up. I don't know anything about the history of it, uh, <laughs> despite right. living there for, you know, a big chunk of my life. But, um, you know, I come to Bangkok and suddenly I'm all about the history. You know, and right. <laughs> similarly, the flip the flip side is that a lot of Thai people don't know anything about Bangkok. And I know way more about the city than for a sure. lot of friends yes. I have. So I, I think that. that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, great guy for sure. And uh, I, I just like the space, you know, it's kind of roughly in the same space that we are. But there's so much about the the Farong experience in Thailand or the expat experience that uh, I say the more the merrier. Yeah, totally. I think a rising tide lifts all boats, man. Let's explore this crazy place. And, you know, we often get some requests from listeners saying, why don't you do video? You guys got to do video. And as someone who majored in editing in, in film school, uh, <laughs> the hell with that, man. Putting together a video, it takes a, it's just, it's just a, it's just like an exponentially more difficult process to edit a podcast video than it is to do the audio. So also hats off to Pat for doing doing the video because it, it ain't easy. And uh, for people who don't know about it, it takes a ton of time. Yeah. I mean, just to get in front of the camera is a whole different ball game. And then, of course, you're right on the back end, the technical end. It's uh, it's pretty rough. Yeah, no kidding. So many thanks for Pat for coming on the show. It was, a, it was great to sit down and talk. Great to meet him. And hopefully we can do so in a more social situation when all this COVID bullshit is over. And uh, for sure. a beer or something like that. But if you haven't, listeners, check out his channel on YouTube. It's really, really cool. He's got some great videos that have some really cool old photos and details of all these old uh, places that you've no doubt heard about. For sure. Thanks a lot, Pat. Yeah. All right. Let's get into some love, loathe, or live with, where one of us picks a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we then discuss and decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept as something that we just have to learn to live with no matter how we feel about it. The last time Ed asked me what I thought about Somtam variations. So this week it is my turn to ask Ed something. Loathe. <laughs> no, I'm just, no, uh, no. I'm totally kind of, neutral. What kind of bias am I dealing with here? I'm not ready so, to say loath. So you just recently returned from a trip back to your native uh, land. Yes, and, I did. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if this is a love, love, like love or loathe, but it's more of like, do you miss this or not? What do you think about most, uh, outside of the shower, most taps, faucets in Thailand having only one temperature? Because most where I grew up have a hot and cold tap. Or faucet so you can control I'm with you 100 percent water i'm with you 100 percent, man like i i noticed it since i've been back exactly like you pointed out i have noticed this thing and here's the honest truth uh the idea of having only one instead of a hot and a cold i totally loathe like in my really? mind in my mind hot and cold is essential <laughs> okay all right all right you've obviously put enough thought for this you know in my mind it's like of course you have to have hot and cold like this is horrible but the truth is in reality it's just like the warm water is just fine it's just basically fine That's right it. so in thailand so, like no. there's usually one tap and the temperature is lukewarm basically and, room it, temperature. and it's basically fine yeah so i guess i'm gonna live with you know so like the reality is i can live with it in theory though i loathe i loathe it that's interesting. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like I, like you know, I, if I go back to Canada, I'm like, of course you need hot and cold water. What if I want cold water for you know brushing my teeth or hot water for you know, yeah. making tea or who know whatever you know, you know. But here it's just like here's your water. It's usually it's, yeah. It's room you know, temperature. Yeah, and it's basically fine. Yeah, and like you said, when I'm back home, I'm like, oh yeah, this is the way to go. But when I'm here, I never say, <laughs> God, I wish I That's had right. the option to choose hot or cold. So I'm a live right. with, I guess, on this one. It's a live with. It's a live with for sure. Double live with. All righty. Final thanks to our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website and connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. 
Yeah, baby. You can also listen to each episode on YouTube. You can send us a voicemail through our website that we'll feature on the show, or even reach out to me directly on Twitter, where I am BKK Greg. So thank you for listening, everyone, and we will see you back here next week. No doubt. Last sip of the uh, rum and coke. <laughs> ah, this should make my video game playing after we record. A plus quality. <laughs> we like playing video games. Have you ever played video games with a kid? It is mind numbing, man. Like they're like, hmm, I wonder if I can jump onto that table. And I'm like, no, you can't. That's not a thing allowed in the game. I'm going to try for our <laughs> next hour just in case. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. So funny. It's horrible. Okay.